Grace and peace of God be with you all this morning. So good to see you all. I pray that uh, you all have had a uh, wonderful time in the Lord already. That uh, there has been a, a call, and uh, the song said it, that, that there's a calling. It, is he calling me? I'm like, yeah. yeah. He's calling me. He's calling all of us into God's presence. I'm going to start with a uh, big um, understatement. Life is messy, isn't it? Yeah, man. How'd you know? That was me. They picked you. No. Where we need peace, it seems to be strife. When we need certainty, we seem to be plunged deeper and deeper into ambiguity. Life is messy. There seems to be this desire to make sense of it all. And the very moment we feel we got it in our grasp, is the meaning slips away through our fingers like so much sand. And that's when the messiness gets... Um, worse. Sometimes life becomes a hot mess. And typically what I say is a hot mess is when you get it over yourself and everybody else in the process. Life is messy. What do you do to make sense of it all? The ancient Greeks response to all the messiness, let's put on a show. Let's put on costumes, let's build sets, let's write stories that get to the heart of the messiness. And they did. There's a long history of Greek tragedies that sought in some way to sort out the contradictions and the confusion and the ambiguity of life. Mass figures would mount the stage and perform stories to entertain to teach. But more importantly, to purge the sickness the audience came to the performance with. Sickness is like fear, cruelty, infidelity to each other, to the city state, infidelity to their own selves. People would come to these outdoor amphitheaters with sickness like apathy, complacency, un restrained pride and unfettered greed because it was believed that those were the things that caused all the messiness and a good performance could fix it. It was drama. Complex stories about complex people in complex times. And the aim was to sort out all the complexity and at the end of the performance, truth would be revealed. There would be this sense of awareness that uh, people would gain and everyone would feel better. Because there was resolution. But if the story ever got too complex and there was too much ambiguity for the writer to resolve, there was a solution. They would roll out the deus ex machina, the God machine. The God machine was an elaborate crane system that would hover an actor uh, dressed at, up like a god over the audience. And there would be smoke and mirrors and, and lights and sound. And as the actor dressed up as a god floated above the audience, they would say something like this, and they all lived happily ever after. And the sights and the sounds and spectacle were so amazing, the people believed that the problem in the story was actually resolved. The messiness was cleaned up. The complexity was now fixed. The, their problems, uh, the questions that they had, had answers. But what really happened was they were only distracted by the spectacle of it all. But the substance of the issue never really got resolved. What do you do 
to make sense of it all. What do we do with all the complexity and ambiguity and the incongruities of these lives that we live? Well, I'm here this morning to share with you the good news that the actual God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, the God of peace and love and compassion, the God we worship stepped into our reality as one of us, as Jesus Christ, and invites us into a relationship in order to train us how to deal with the complexities of life. It's a relationship called a discipleship relationship. A discipleship relationship is one where we partner with God and one another to train in the ways and teachings of Jesus Christ. Because when we practice attempting to show up like Jesus, when we don't try, but we train to live out the teachings of Jesus Christ, it moves us into a deeper relationship with God that expands our capacity to deal with the messiness of these lives we're living. It's a discipleship relationship. It's a kind of relationship that we learn a lot about in the Gospel of Mark. And this is what I want to encourage you to explore with me in this sermon series called Immerse, Discipleship, and the Gospel of Mark. And not only do I want us to explore discipleship together, but I also want to encourage, maybe convince, definitely beg us to get into these kinds of relationships so that we can answer Jesus' call that he makes to all of us when he says, come, follow me. It's a transformative kind of relationship. And one of the reasons it's such a transformative relationship can be found in Mark chapter 7. Let me read this again. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands. That is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. And there are also many other traditions that they observe. The washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts, their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commands of God and hold to human traditions. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that even intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Pray with me. God of grace and glory, we worship you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this gathering. I pray that your presence is thick with us and around us and in us, dear God. And may there be something said, something experienced, something heard from your spirit that forms and shapes us and makes us the people you want us to be. This is your time and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're all walking around trying to figure out how to figure out this thing called life to make sense of all the messiness. And we all have different ways of doing it. That was certainly the case in Jesus' time. 
In Judaism at the time, you had a bunch of different sets of, or groups of uh, trying to get at this thing called life in a bunch of different ways. The priestly class, the Sadducees, had this plan. They thought, well, if we can just maintain the temple, if we can get temple worship right, everything would stop being messy. Then there were the group or the set called the Essenes and their thought, let's get as far away from those unclean people as we possibly can. And as the farther we get away from them, the less messy life will be. Then you had the Zealots, their group was, let's just kill all the enemies and their collaborators. That'll make life simple, won't it? Then the Pharisees that we read about in the text, they, they, their, their idea was this. Adapt the ancient laws in a way that they could be kept in any and all circumstances. And that's how we'll make sense of life. This is how we'll honor God. Adapt the laws and rules of God so you can make sure to keep them at all times. Each of these groups figured out a way of making things make sense. And all of a sudden, all these groups saw who they believed was some nobody rabbi named Jesus from this nowhere town, gaining a lot of followers, and he's not doing any of these things. As a matter of fact, they thought this Jesus of Nazareth was doing the complete opposite of many of these things. Eating with tax collectors and sinners. They weren't fasting. His disciples were gathering food on the Sabbath. He was healing people on the Sabbath. And, and, and talk about not trying to kill enemies or, or trying to avoid them. This Jesus of Nazareth is going around preaching and actually doing it. He's loving enemies. The very moment Mark talks about the Pharisees are coming from Jerusalem to investigate what's going on with Jesus. You know this is a moment that is just ripe with tension and volatility. They're just waiting to see that Jesus does something wrong, does something out of the ordinary, and then they see it. His disciples are eating with defiled hands. See, in the Old Testament book of Exodus, God told priests to wash their hands and feet before they entered the tabernacle or temple. This was in Exodus 30. So the Pharisees thought it would be a good idea for them to do it as well. And, and not only for them to do it, but for every Jew, Jewish person to do it. And to do it not only when they entered the temple, but whenever they did anything, when they ate or when they slept. And, and it became very ceremonial. What you would do is you would take a cup in your right hand and you would fill it with water. Then you would transfer it to your left hand and then you would just pour one, two, three, water over the hand, making sure it gets to the wrist. Then you would flip the hand. One, two, three, the left hand, making sure it gets to the wrist. It's very ceremonial. It's actually a very wonderful tradition. The thought was, well, if I'm going to get something to eat, I'm going to eat in the presence of God. And if I'm going to eat in the presence of God, I have to ensure my own purity. That's how they thought they were going to make sense of life. This is how they thought they were going to honor God. So they asked Jesus, why aren't your disciples doing things the right way? Why are they always, do, why, why are they doing things, as, as Joel said before, uh, uh, the way, they're not doing it the way we always did it. And more importantly, why aren't you teaching them the right way to do it? And Jesus has thought, because this has become more about spectacle than substance. I think this is why Jesus brings up another aspect of theatrical performance when he calls them hypocrites. It's a word that is associated with theatrical masks. Theatrical masks display an image on the outside that doesn't reflect what's going on in the inside. They were acting apart, but they weren't being at their depth who they were attempting to betray. And I think all of us can be guilty of that, can't we? I think the easiest uh, accusation you can put on 99% of Christians is hypocrisy. Oh, it's just me. 
No, I mean, can any of us really live up to the aspirational language that we talk about as Christians? Come on, saints. Come on, holy people of God. Oh, it's just me. We got to try. And maybe not only try, but train. Train in the context of a relationship with God and one another to do the things of God in a way that it doesn't become spectacle, but substance. And discipleship is always done with an eye on what we do. Do, do a thing long enough and it can lose its significance and be reduced to mere spectacle. Gathering for worship, singing these amazing songs, participating in these amazing practices like communion and giving. These are practices but are more spiritual disciplines because the prayer is with God we discipline ourselves to make sure we're doing them with substance. Do a thing long enough and it can lose its significance and be reduced to mere identity markers. History seems to suggest when life gets really messy and complex, we tend to create borders and boundaries to assure ourselves of who's in and who's out, who we can trust and who we can't trust. A lot of traditions, while beginning as really good and healthy life-affirming practices, can turn into a means of identifying who's in and who's out, who's with us and who is not. And in response to all the smoke and mirrors and all the acting and spectacle, all the possible boundary markings and settings, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah to get to the real issue, the conditions of our hearts. Jesus is claiming their hearts are far from me. Teaching us all, disciples of Jesus Christ, hearts move towards the heart of God. As I was praying through this text and really thinking about it in the last few weeks, I, it just broke my heart, this notion that many of us and myself and everybody else included, sometimes in their life, walks with their heart far from God. We love God, we want to do the things of God, but if, if we don't do this thing with, with real intention, we could walk around with our hearts being far from God. But the lesson is, the disciples of Jesus Christ move their hearts towards the heart of God. Jesus offers the people in his time and ours a sobering truth. This is verse 21. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, debauchery, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. It's interesting to note that when you look at all of these issues of the heart in the Hebrew, all of them have something to do with acquisition and taking. Every vice Jesus mentioned on this list has something to do with taking what is not yours, taking away somebody's credibility, taking someone's peace, taking away the truth, while hearts that are close to God's own heart are hearts that are tuned to generosity. Teaching us all. Disciples of Jesus Christ do the work of the heart. The disciples' work is the inward look at the heart. With God and the trusted people of God, we look at the wounds we carry in the heart and pray for and work towards that healing. In partnership with God and the trusted people of God, we do the interior work of asking the hard questions. I just decided I was going to share a whole bunch of those questions that I work with people through. You got that list? You can take a look. 
What are my core values? And am I living by them? In what situation am I most hard on myself? In what situation do I feel less than? What triggers lead to unhealthy habits, poor reactions, and sin? Is there something I haven't asked forgiveness for? Is there something I haven't forgiven myself for? Do I practice negative self-talk and how can I switch that narrative? With pain, shame, or heartbreak, can I let go? What's my biggest fear? And why? Disciples of Jesus Christ partner with God and trusted brothers and sisters to cry of Christ to interrogate why we do what we do so that what we do doesn't become spectacle, but is always a real abiding substance. Discipleship with Jesus Christ gets to the heart, to the intention. It trains us to look at what we do and why we do what we do as individuals and as communities of faith. Because we can sing with instruments or without, but if we don't do come with the intention to allow that singing to transform our hearts, it really doesn't matter. We could do communion with plastic cups, metal cups, ceramic cups, one cup, many cups. If we're not doing it with the intention that it's going to transform us when we do it, it doesn't matter. We can raise holy hands like this. We can hold open hands like this. We can even sit on our hands. And if we don't intend for any of it to transform the interior of our heart, it really doesn't matter. How does the Apostle Paul say it in 1 Corinthians 13? If I could speak in tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a, a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. Followers of Jesus Christ do what we do with the intention that we, it will allow, we will allow the Holy Spirit to transform who we are. and transform our hearts to hearts of love. We allow the Holy Spirit access to our hearts to make them new, new hearts of love. Here's a dangerous prayer that uh, Sharita taught me years ago and, and I'll challenge you all to pray it as well. Here's the dangerous prayer. Reve God, reveal my heart to me. God, reveal my heart to me it's a dangerous prayer because a lot of prayers god don't answer like that prayer for that new car that might not happen but at the moment you pray god, pray god reveal myself to me oh my goodness god is like yes lads opens up our heart our chest and just starts pulling all sorts of things out and i didn't know that was there yes it is i didn't know that was there yes it is deep down in there oh yes it is it's all in there God, reveal myself to me. Family, here's the good news of the morning. We do not have a God hovering above us, pronouncing resolution where there is none. We have a God who comes down where we are and gets into the messiness with us so we know that we are not alone. He gets down, God gets down in the messiness with us to resolve it. We don't have a God in the machine. We got a God in the flesh. We have a God who, in, in, instead of flying above us, hangs on a cross down here with us, suspended between the messiness of life and death, holiness and sin, clean and the unclean, to reconcile it for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have a God whose holiness doesn't force a move away from us, but forces a move towards us. We don't have a God who is setting up boundaries. We have a God who has invited you to train to do life in the messiness with wisdom, justice, compassion, power, and a generosity of heart. 
What are you doing to make sense of it all? Whatever you're doing, can I ask you not to do it alone? Amen? Amen. God bless you.